Now, following this strike, Seattle's most wealthy and largest employers founded the American, or I'm sorry, the, the Associated Industries of Seattle, which was a conglomerate of bosses from the waterfront, from the metalworks, and from building companies, right? Their main goal was to, was to make sure that unions were squashed. Basically, what they had created was like an anti-union union is what they created. They created an anti-union union, right? They're like the Thanos of labor, you guys, you know? What they want to do is wipe out one half of life and then try to profit off of the other half. Welcome to a brand new episode of Fork Full of Noodles. I'm your host, Krish Mohan. Uh, hey, so you might, uh, you might hear some laughter in the background of this episode, and that's because it was recorded in front of a live virtual stand-up comedy audience uh, via Zoom. I've been doing uh, these uh, live virtual stand-up comedy shows called the Citizen Revolution Comedy Shows, and then they eventually get recorded, and then they become the episodes of Fork Full of Noodles that you are watching today. They happen uh, almost every single Friday night, uh, and they're going to be happening all through July, all through August, and well into the fall as well, since we are in the, the digital age of the quarantine. So I've, I've pivoted a lot of my performances uh, to be online and to be via Zoom. So if you are interested in being a part of the live virtual stand-up comedy audience, I hope you do. Uh, you, can, you can get those tickets uh, right in the link below, or the description below, not the link below, the description below. Uh, you can click on the link and that'll take you to all of the ticket links uh, for all of the dates that uh, are available in July and August. And you can keep an eye on the dates and keep up to date with uh, when I'm gonna be doing uh, fringe festivals and other live performances uh, via Zoom virtually um, on my website at krishmohan.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N.com. Uh, so go and check it out there. And if you would like to uh, support the show, if you would like to support uh, all of the other projects I do from uh, the interview podcast to the rantier videos to the you know shorter current events new segments that I do, uh, you can be become a sustaining member right on my website uh, via my website or Patreon or Bandcamp. Uh, or you can make a one-time donation as well. Uh, this is how I am currently earning my uh, earning my living. So this is uh, th that would be that'd be super helpful <laughs> if you guys decided to become sustaining members. And I uh, hope that you do. I hope that you come to the to live stand-up comedy show. And now, without any further ado, let's dive into this week's episode. Now, throughout history, there there have been various examples of the general strike that has benefited the working class. One of the most famous of these strikes that is not taught in schools is the Seattle General Strike of 1919. This was happening at a time when Eugene Debs and the Socialist Party of America and the international workers of the world were gaining a lot more traction, right? America had seen the, the Bolshevik revolution in Russia as a threat to all of the freedoms that were bestowed about upon them by Jesus in an eagle form. You know, the, you, go. you know that story? You guys remember that awesome Bible <laughs> story? <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Came down as an eagle and then transformed into Uncle Sam. Yep. That was <laughs> so. But here's I the problem. I saw that character. Yeah. 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 Exactly. But here's the problem that was happening in 1919, is that the, there was a lot of internal turmoil within the unions themselves, right? There was a lot of difference of opinions of what unions were supposed to do and what they stood for. For example, the American Federation of Labor uh, was a lot more conservative back in 1919 and almost exclusively white and male. They were basically like the sausage fest of unions, you know, 
at the end of every meeting, they would, they would always yell, no homo, just to, just to be safe. That's who they were. The international, <laughs> now, the international workers of the world were building a far more diverse coalition of workers. They were basically like the Avengers of the labor movement, you know? They were assembling to take down the ultimate grand threat to the working class. Fucking capitalism, you guys. <laughs> they were ready to take them down. So the Seattle general strike begins with World War I, right? Younger folks had to flock to places like Seattle to help them build ships and armaments. Right. Yeah, the federal government had actually frozen wages to help the war effort, but they promised these workers that they would get a raise after the war. And when those raises never showed up, the unions wanted to negotiate and the managers totally ignored them. 35,000 shipyard workers went on strike immediately. And immediately yeah. after that, the rest of the city joined in on that strike in solidarity. Now, while the unions and the members of the IWW were organizing this general strike, the city's newspapers, which all had ties to uh, you know, big rich people, were printing stories nice. about how the strikes are un-American. Yeah. But these socialists, the socialists that we know, uh, had papers of their own. Uh, and a woman named Anna Louise Strong penned an op-ed uh, that kind of set the world on fire. <laughs> we are undertaking the most tremendous move ever made by labor in this country. A move which will lead no one knows where. Labor will feed the people. Labor will care for the babies and the sick. Labor will preserve order. She changed it into a drama, us versus them, the workers versus the capitalist. Which, this is like the first like viral thing that happened. Uh, you know, that there, it, it might be the, uh, the first time that a hashtag was ever invented. Uh, it was on a picket sign. Uh, but that joke didn't land, that's fine. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, now, these organizers had set the strike to ensure that no one would show up to work in, February, in early February of 1919. The Democratic mayor of Seattle, a guy by the name of Ollie Hansen, grew more and more paranoid and fearful. So he decided that he's going to deputize a bunch of citizens and a bunch of college kids. He saw an opportunity to play on the public's fears of a workers' revolution. Ole Hansen was an opportunist of the first order. He inflated this for all it was worth and saw personal advantage probably right from the start. It was to Hansen's best interest to make the strike as radical as it could be perceived. Hansen warned citizens that a dangerous revolution was at hand. He deputized and armed hundreds of private citizens, including many young students from the University of Washington. He sent them into the streets to enforce order. Now, if you ever needed proof that the rich and powerful use, were using the working class as cannon fodder, it's in the constant use of children as a deputized police force to stop the advancement of human rights. You know. So he also called in the National Guard, right? He set up machine guns and had army trucks all around the city. Guys, this strike hadn't even started yet. Could you imagine if this was happening today, right? Like the strike hasn't started. There's military people all over the streets. I bet you that the mainstream media would come out and claim that these army trucks were driven by Antifa and that the anarchists <laughs> had go up in these trucks. <laughs> They're out there Absolutely. trying, you know, they're out there trying to incite violence, right? I, actually, right here, this is a picture of the, of the Antifa headquarters, right? If you got, you got to squint and you got to kind of punch yourself in the eye and then the, <laughs> the head trauma that you caused yourself will show you where Antifa is. So <laughs> it's, it's very exciting. <laughs> we found them, you guys. 
here's here's the truth of what happened, right? Not one striker was violent. When the day came for the general strike, 65,000 workers just didn't show up to work. The city yeah. was totally silent. Yeah. And then rumors started spreading around that Ollie Hansen had been murdered. <gasps> Nothing moved but the tide. The eerie silence bred rumors that the mayor had been assassinated and buildings blown up. But here, my guess is that all of this rumor uh, was started by Ole Hansen, right? To try to blame it on the strikers. That would be my guess in this situation. But here's the thing. People started getting restless. Well, once the rumor mill starts going around, people start getting restless. So the organizers of the, of the strike itself tapped into their ranks and they had unarmed veterans maintain order. Fearing that the city could descend into chaos, labor organized a group of unarmed war veterans to help police the strikers. They patrolled the city, breaking up crowds and urging strikers to keep the peace. The labor movement had planned very carefully for the strike and their number one object and concern was we cannot have any violence, we cannot have any sense of disorder. And they were completely successful at this. The organizers also set up kitchens in various parts of town. Uh, they fed families. They were delivering milk to homes, oil to hospitals. They collected trash, and for the five days that this strike went on, some of the guardsmen that were stationed in Seattle itself said that they had never seen a city run with more order and peace. Which is almost like, like if you give people their basic needs and actually like take care of them, there's like no reason for citizens to you know like steal and and hurt each other. You know, it's cra it's crazy. In five, in five days, in one city, we were able to go from capitalist primates slinging poo at each other, <laughs> you know, for cash, into a more evolved species that was doing its part to make our community vibrant and far more meaningful. It was amazing. So when Ole Hansen couldn't get these strikers to be violent, he just started arresting people. He started arresting all of the strike organizers um, and then blocking um, the, the workers from getting any of the resources that they needed. And then he started threatening martial law on people. And eventually, because the organizers were arrested, there was threats of martial law, people were getting hungry and restless. Because of the lock, lack of morale, the strike ended. The general strike of 1919 is, has mixed results. Right, the shipping industry never came back to what it was, it never got back up to its glory, but it did scare the employers and created a different sense of what was possible. Now, Ole Hansen became a hero because America loves its paranoid strongmen who use fear as a <laughs> sense of morality. <laughs> we love it, you know, Nixon, Trump, we love it. It's a big, it's a big deal. <laughs> Now, the, the bosses feared what the general strike had actually proven. As Dana Frank, the labor history professor at the University of California in Santa Cruz, points out, it, di it, just, it didn't just show union power to employers, but it showed that working people could run the city themselves. It asks the question out of all of us, do we need Congress or politicians or legislators if we, the people, can provide what we need ourselves. The Seattle General Strike of 1919 is proof that working people had power in kind of an indirect way. Now, following this strike, Seattle's most wealthy and largest employers founded the American, or I'm sorry, the, the Associated Industries of Seattle, which was a conglomerate of bosses from the waterfront from the metalworks and from building companies, right? Their main goal was to, was to make sure that unions were squashed. Basically what they had created was like an anti-union union is what they created. They created an anti-union union, right? 
they're like the Thanos of labor, you guys. You know, what they want to do is wipe out one half of life and then try to profit off of the other half. That's what they want to do. And what they claimed, they tried to use this class consciousness uh, to, to their advantage, right? They came out and claimed that they were fighting against working class tyranny. Guys, we really have to stop oppressing the rich, okay? We really, we gotta stop. I mean, we're out there, you know, fucking marching, saying things like, we want human rights. But, but have any of us really stopped and thought about a rich person's super yacht? Well, I mean, where are these people? people too. Yeah, yachts are people too, you guys. Yachts are people too. Where are these where are these trust fund kids going to pop champagne on the asses of hoes? <laughs> what are they, on regular yachts? What is this? Russia? This is America, people. Okay. <laughs> Can't do it on a pontoon boat, man. You can't do it on a pontoon boat, you guys. Okay, that you can maybe shotgun a Miller Lite. That's allowed on a pontoon. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you can't go beyond the Miller, right? Guys, how are we going to get these people more private helicopters with their own personal prostitutes if they have to pay a living wage? Have you guys thought about this? Tom? I bet none of you fucking thought about this. Selfish is what that is. Now these. Uh, these Associated Industries of Seattle, uh, they also employed spies to try to bring the union down from the inside. There were personal papers uh, that were released by, uh, from, from two major employers that hired these spies to disrupt union action. What this involved is uh, cops being called on the IWW headquarters and they would come in and they, they would try to break up any sort of demonstration that was going on, right? Basically, this was like America's version of James Bond, uh, which, just, which just turned out to be like the Uncle Tom of labor. That's essentially what it turned out to be, right? Like they're just, just trying to keep poor people poorer and suckling at the teats of power. That's really all they're doing. They also hired the Pinkertons and other detective agencies to follow members of the union around. And then they created their own unions and used that as a way to prohibit immigrants from being hired and then use that as a way to demonize unions even further, right? These, these are the rich billionaires in our society that we like to fawn and glorify, right? The racist xenophobes that want you to suffer for their wealth. That's who they really are. Now, as a major city in, in America was, you know, attacking its working class with spies and thugs and <laughs> military, <laughs> Canada was in the midst of its own general strike. In 1919, uh, Canada was also suffering through a post-war recession. Uh, pay was down and the cost of living was going up. You know, kind of like how a logical economy is supposed to run. <laughs> you know, you, mm. you just got to pay people less and then skyrocket the price of everything else. Just like, just like how the logic works. Now... <laughs> Canadian workers were having a problem with union recognition. A lot of these bosses were not recognizing the union, so they were talking about a one big union, similar to what the international workers of the world were. Uh, when managers did want to negotiate with metal and trade unions, they called for a strike. So in May of 1919, 30,000 workers from the police, the fire department, garment workers, utility, all walked off the job. They all walked off the job, yeah, in, in solidarity with their working class brothers and sisters. Now, a citizen committee of a thousand people was formed to stop that strike. So that's a thousand nays to 30,000 yays. That's a little bit of a difference, <laughs> you know? I'm not, I'm not a math genius, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing the scales being tipped in one direction, right? And the fact that the government ignores so many voices is kind of proof that democracy isn't real, right? Now, the, the Citizen Committee of, uh, of a thousand people pretty much used uh, xenophobia and racism as, and fear as much as they could, right? They got, they got papers to print that these strikers were alien 
scum, alien scum, you guys. And the government si sided with the vocal minority, and they threatened to fire seven, a lot of these federal employees and then deport British immigrants, which I think is the first time that I think any British person has ever heard that they're going to be deported out of a country. <laughs> right? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that normally doesn't happen. <laughs> but this is kind of like the classic defense that abusive partners use, isn't it? Right? They're just like, you you wanna you wanna see crazy? Oh, I'll show you crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then they like bite the head off of a bat, you know? Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, and then you're like, where'd you get that bat from? Have you <laughs> have you just had this bat on you the whole time? How did I not see this bat? <laughs> What is happening right now? That was the Canadian government, you guys. <laughs> That's what the Canadian government was. So on, uh, on June 17th, 10 of the strike leaders were arrested, right? Similar to what happened in Seattle. Ten, 10 of these strike leaders were arrested. But on June 21st, the rank and file organized a peaceful march, which was met, obviously, uh, with police brutality from the mounted police which the amount of police are just like fancy horse cops. That's really all they are. They were just <laughs> fancy horse cops. Now, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> it kind of just sounded like they were going to joust some protesters, but it was like way worse than that, you guys. Uh, what happened was that the cops fired shots. The crowd turned violent. They overturned a streetcar. You know, two strikers were killed and 30 were injured. This incident is famously known as Bloody Saturday in Canada. Uh, and uh, Bono did not write a song about this. He did not write a song about this at all. I mean, you could have done a twofer, you know? You could have done Bloody Sunday, and then you could have done Bloody Saturday. It's like a part one, part two kind of thing. Bono, you fucking missed out, Bono. You missed <laughs> out. Now, the Canadian government did set up a memorial for the streetcar instead of the people. They did do that, so that was nice. They built a statue of a streetcar. That is a joke. Uh, I feel like oh, you okay. guys... <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> when I wrote that, I was mildly concerned that oh, people sorry. were going to take it too fucking seriously. Uh, <laughs> I did. Yeah. Totally. Because I think one of the worst things that's happened in 2020 oh. is that satire has just been bitch slapped in the face. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> and I wrote that, I was like, they're going to get it. They're pretty smart. They're going to get it. But you guys were just like, holy fuck, did they really build a statue for a streetcar? That's crazy. What the fuck? Absolutely. Oh, <laughs> uh, I'm going to get sued by Canada. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> so... Uh, seven out of ten of the strike leaders were charged with conspiracy to topple the government. And uh, the other three were released. And when they were released, they called an end to the strike because they didn't want to see any more bloodshed, right? These strike leaders uh, eventually, by the late 1920s, wound up in the Canadian government, which eventually led to Canadian workers receiving collective bargaining rights 30 years after the general strike. So by 1950, they received uh, collective bargaining uh, rights in Canada. Now, we head back to the States. Uh, in 1934, that was another big year for general strikes, right? 65,000 textile workers walked off the job starting in North Carolina. One factory would shut down and the workers would all basically go from town to town. They were like factory towns at the time, calling out other workers on strike, and then workers in that plant would also walk off the job and come on strike, and the crowd would grow. I and mean, we're talking about the self-activity of the working class at its most effective. The New York Times warned, the grave danger of the situation is that it will get completely out of the hands of the leaders. For workers, it was the other way around. The real danger was posed by business leaders and the representatives in government. The way rulers responded was with some of the worst 
bloody violence in U.S. history. I mean, just coming in and shooting down peaceful pickets, bayoneting in the South, bayoneting, using bayonets to kill strikers who were wearing, ironically, peaceful picket buttons. Uh, 1934 also saw taxi strikes, saw trucking strikes, warehouse strikes from all across the country, right? This was, this was happening nationwide, right? We just talked about what was going on all through the South. In Toledo, Toledo, Ohio, workers from auto plants led a strike, right? Radical socialists were being voted into the leadership of unions because people wanted to see radical change instead of just fucking platitudes from rich people, you know? So under the leadership of one of these radicals, uh, the strike took in the unemployed of Toledo, who would normally have been hired as scabs or strike workers to replace these striking workers, right? So check this out. Each of these cases, I think it's important to say that radicals of one kind or another were elected to the leadership. They were very democratic. The first one was the American Workers Party, which was led by A.J. Musty, and they had the ingenious idea of mobilizing unemployed people to join the picket lines. That kept the unemployed from scabbing or strike breaking on the strike. It brought them into the struggle and essentially that is how the Toledo Auto Light strike was won. So basically what they did was uh, with the help of the rank and file, they, they fed these unemployed, they protected them, they, they provided them housing if that's what they needed, and they used the power of mutual aid to bring them into the strike and help them out and give them a reason to join the strike. You know, they, they wanted their lives to be better as well. So the auto companies had basically lost their way to replace employees, so the National Guard was sent in and a bunch of strike leaders were arrested, so much like Winnipeg, they organized a, 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 a march, right? And these guardsmen, they threatened these strikers who refused uh -oh. to fight. So they opened fire on the strikers. The strikers fight back. Uh, and eventually, once the bosses and the government saw that these strikers are not backing down, they recognized the unions, they increased the wages, and then they rehired the workers to go back in and start doing their jobs, like you see over here. That was only because the, the strikers stood in solidarity with themselves. Now, San Francisco, on the other hand, becomes a, a war zone, right? As longshoremen uh, went on strike and garnered uh, the support of basically every union in the city again. Uh, and because of the state of the economy in, in the 30s, longshoremen didn't have steady work. They'd all have to go down to the docks and be picked by a foreman. There was like a lot of... Um, a lot of bribery happening, and a lot of people described it as a slave market, right? All of a sudden, this was the time in history where white folks were like, oh, holy shit, is, is this what we've been doing to black and brown people? Oh, my God, this is awful. <laughs> we should not do this anymore. <laughs> now, once the, the strike began... 100,000 workers had walked off the job, and the strikes were all peaceful. They were all peaceful. So in order to instigate it, the National Guard was called in to protect law and order by blowing up a little part of the city. They just had to blow it up a little bit uh, and maintain that law and order. And you had New Deal advocates like Hugh Johnson and a bunch of union leaders that were condemning the general strike, right? But the rank and file wouldn't budge. So here's what, here's what uh, Hugh Johnson had to say about that. You are living out here under the stress of a general strike. Now the right of dissatisfied men to strike against a recalcitrant employer is inviolate. But the general strike is quite another matter. That is a threat to the community. That is a menace to government. That is civil war. Uh, that guy's a Democrat that's advocating for the New Deal with FDR, by the way, who, who just called a general strike in 1934 a civil war amongst the people. <laughs> so by the end of that strike, the longshoremen didn't get what they wanted. 
right? Uh, the military force had ended up winning out in San Francisco. So unfortunately, San Francisco uh, was, was a loss uh, as a general strike. But Minneapolis, Minnesota was a completely different story. In 1934, Minneapolis Teamsters led a, a strike of truck drivers and delivery men. And they got super organized in Minneapolis and started using military tactics to push back against the government agitators. They monitored police radios, gave instructions in code, and created disguised patrols to locate and subdue potential strike breakers. At the same time, the Teamsters made sure that hospitals were kept running and food delivered to the hungry. A committee of 100 rank and file strikers was elected to direct day-to-day -day activities. Women created their own auxiliary group to organize demonstrations at City Hall, nurse injured strikers, and prepare meals. The Teamsters had massive support among other Minneapolis workers. 35,000 building trades workers walked out in sympathy, as did the city's taxi drivers. The Farm Holiday Association, a militant farmers group, provided contributions of food. Hundreds of non-Teamster workers showed up at strike headquarters daily to offer their services. Now, because they were able to take care of each other, uh, the cops attacked every last one of them. Uh, the, <laughs> the, the first fatality was a, was a guy named Henry Ness, as you can see here. His funeral garnered about 40,000 people uh, who were in attendance. And the public opinion was for the Teamsters and their demands. So instead of listening to the public, the National Guard gets called in again. And labor leaders are all arrested and then put into camps. And once that happened, I think everybody was like, oh, shit, this is a real bad look. Uh, I, I feel like this camp idea is going to get like a real bad rap one day. We, mm, mm, mm. we should probably not do this. Right. So once that happened, uh, the Teamsters basically won their demands for better pay and better work conditions. So the, so the Minneapolis general strike was was a massive success, a massive success. I do want to point this out. This is the use of military force in American streets over the right to protest and strike against inequality. So mm -hmm. it's been done before, and it was validated by Democrats and Republicans alike. This is another point of proof that the removal of Trump is basically meaningless without the removal of a corrupt warmongering duopoly that's ready to murder its own citizens asking for human rights. Authoritarianism in America has existed long before 2016. It's been around for a very long time. Weeks, months. Weeks, at least, at least a couple weeks, you guys. At least a couple <laughs> weeks before 2016. Yeah. Now, after uh, 1934, you see the Wagner Act that was signed in 1935, and that legislatively gave collective bargaining rights to workers. It was, it was the, uh, the first piece of legislation that strengthened the unions, and it wouldn't have happened without these general strikes that were happening all across the country that really put pressure on these, uh, on these legislators that were kind of toeing the line, right? The, the Democrats have always kind of been pro-business. Uh, and and pro employer uh, rather than rather than pro pro worker essentially. So after World War II, right? Fast forward after World War II, uh, there is a fear that organized labor would grow even stronger. So you had <sighs> Senator Taft out of Ohio and Senator Hartley out of New Jersey who put mm -hmm. forth a piece of legislation to undo the Wagner Act. Now I think that this is proof that without any shadow of a doubt that nothing good has come out of the state of New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can unequivocally. <laughs> Trump went bankrupt there. <laughs> Trump did go bankrupt there, so I guess. Bruce <laughs> Springsteen. Oh, I knew fucking somebody was gonna bring up Springsteen. All right. Got you there, man. <laughs> I'm gonna. 
I'm gonna go on my Springsteen rant. This might this might get me canceled, but I'm gonna fucking do it. <laughs> listen. Bruce Springsteen also not great from uh, from New Jersey. Uh, look, the man says that he's for the working class, but he calls himself the boss. Come on. <laughs> You made one Good point. point. Come, on. <laughs> Come on, Bruce. Fair enough. <laughs> right? If you were really for the people, you'd call yourself the fucking proletariat, dog. The like, worker, yeah. <laughs> all I'm gonna all I'm gonna say is his mansion has gates. That's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> his mansion has gates. This, and that's the most, <laughs> yeah, I feel like that's the most controversial statement I've made all night. <laughs> 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 There's just people unsubscribing from my channel right now. <laughs> okay, all right, okay. I'm going to I'm going to interject myself uh in this video here. I did make fun of New Jersey saying that there's nothing good that came out of New Jersey and a bunch of people clearly had a issue with it and brought up the the Bruce Springsteens and you guys just watched the rant uh that I just did about uh about about Mr. Springsteen there. Uh, but I will say that uh, my uh, a friend of mine uh, posted on my Facebook wall, uh, pointing out uh, some 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 cool people um, that have that have come out of uh, New Jersey. Just to name a few, Meryl Streep. She's pretty cool. I like Meryl Streep. Peter Dinklage, solid solid actor there. Uh, Zach Braff. All right, I'll give you the first couple seasons of Scrubs. That's not bad. Uh, you know, Paul Rudd, Wyclef Jean, excellent. And, and this one kind of hit close to home. Uh, John Stewart is also from New Jersey. And, uh, and I forgot about that. So, so, so I, I'll retract that statement a little bit, kind of. I'll keep the statements about Bruce Springsteen, but I'll retract the statement that nothing good has ever come out. Of, a few good things have come out of New Jersey. I will amend my statement by saying a couple of nice things have come out of New Jersey, uh, but primarily John Stewart. Uh, that is the person that has got me into comedy, and that person comes from New Jersey, and that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a tough one for me to swallow, you guys. Okay, that's a personal thing for me. Like I have to, I have to hold on to that and process that over the next maybe few years. I'm not sure, but that's that is something that's going to happen. Back to the end of the video. Oh shit! There's only four of us left. <laughs> yeah, everybody's everybody's leaving. They're like, "How the fuck do we get out of here? Do we can we get?" Out of here? <laughs> guys, going against the boss, man. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, the 1947 Taft Hartley Act ensured that unions would basically lose all their powers. Right? They limited the they limited strikes, uh, and then they also said that the unions couldn't donate to political campaigns but they said nothing about corporations donating to political campaigns. Um, they also said that if a strike was determined to be a health risk, then a strike would be illegal and unions would be criminally fined, would be criminally fined to organize, right? And now the union was, was put into a place that uh, when a majority of w was struck in the workplace, you can't have a union unless everybody voted on it. Uh, and, and a majority said that they wanted to be in a union. Uh, and this basically gave corporations an opportunity to push anti-union propaganda, which is still in practice today. So that's, that's in this piece of legislation that legally allows them to show anti-union propaganda. Now, in 1959, this bill was reformed to include some things like, um, if you're gonna vote for a union, if, you, if, you're, if you're a company that wants a union, you have to count the vote of strike breakers as well. So bills like these, <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, right? It, 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 does, it does make any sense, but that's kind of what it was designed to do. Um, okay. Yeah, bills, I mean, bills like this are, are designed to depower, defund, and right. demoralize unions. That's what they're built for. It's an entire generation of workers that uh that that hate unions now it made them believe that they need to give up their own rights to to make their bosses richer that would kind of make them richer in the end it's another version of trickle down right and mm -hmm. we have yet to see any of that stuff actually happen trickle down is yet to happen you know it, basically republicans used bills like these to cancel unions which 
which kind of makes Republicans the originators of cancel culture, you guys. They're the ones <laughs> they're, they're the ones that came up with it. They they started the whole fucking thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, okay, so all of this isn't for me to come out and say we can't win, right? This is this is not me trying to be cynical or 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 pessimistic about this. The point of all this is to say that we've won before and we can fucking do it again, right? We can use the power of labor yet again to regain more equality in our workplaces. If we repeat the steps of all the shit that we learned from, the, from 1919, from 1934, from all of this, uh, this, the, the, the slave rebellions that were general strikes and keep an eye out for the propaganda, we can probably win again. Because we've shown time and time again that we, the people, are way more organized than the government itself. So let's get more organized, you know? You had Republican President Abraham Lincoln that is quoted to say, labor is prior to an independent of capital. Capital is the only fruit of labor and could have never existed if labor had not first existed. Look at every instance both the bosses and the government claim that capital is far more valuable than the labor produced by the worker. But in every instance, there's more and more people that see that for the bullshit that it is. Look, if we want a better society, then I see no other next step than a general strike. The end. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, appreciate it. And that has been your fork full of noodles for this week. Uh, if you enjoyed this episode, if you like the content that we're putting up on this channel, make sure that you like, share, and subscribe to this channel. All three of those things help this channel grow, help uh, other people see this channel and discover this channel. Um, platforms like YouTube and Facebook and uh, you know, other uh, other platforms don't particularly like to show content like this, show um, engaging content that talks about history and the truth and what's actually going on with our system in, at, at hand. So uh, I depend on you guys, the viewers, that if you guys like it, to make sure that you hit the like and then make sure that you share it with uh, whoever you think is going to enjoy uh, content like this, whether it's a friend or a family member or an enemy, whoever it is, uh, you guys could share that with. That would be awesome. And make sure that you're subscribed. Um, I, there, there's the more people that subscribe to this channel, again, the more that it'll be shown to other people and the more updates you'll get from my channel. I release videos uh, pretty consistently, uh, at least uh, a few times a week. Um, I do a live stream uh, via my Facebook page uh, uh, two or three times a week as well, where you get to talk to me and interact with me while we go over some you know, news stories that might have fallen through the cracks or mainstream media just doesn't touch at all. So. Uh, yeah, I hope you guys do that. Uh, the other way that you can help support this show is uh, by making a financial contribution, if that is uh, if that is possible for you to do. Uh, it is it is not a necessity. Uh, all of my content is going to be available for free. Very little goes behind a paywall. But if you do become a sustaining member via my website, uh, via Patreon, or via Bandcamp, it does give you unreleased stand-up comedy and storytelling content that nobody else gets. That's a little perk, that's a little thing behind the paywall. Uh, you get early uh, access to full episodes of Forkful of Noodles. Like these are, these are segments of a much larger piece. You get the larger piece before anybody else does. You get early access to that. Uh, you get uh, free tickets to the live virtual stand-up comedy shows where these clips are from. Um, and, uh, and a bunch of other stuff. There's going to be some merch coming up. Um, I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be releasing some new merch as well. So, uh, keep your eyes, uh, out peeled for that. And that'll be avail All will be available on my website at krishmohan.com. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N.com. Uh, I also have a new stand-up comedy album and, um, that is available on all of the platforms you get your comedy stuff from and uh one of the things i'm doing with these virtual stand-up comedy shows and the uh merch sales whether it's like the t-shirt stuff or if it's the album is i am going to be donating half of the um 
half of the sales to a grassroots organization, uh, you know, like a mutual aid or a particular a grassroots venue that I've worked with um, or, you know, uh, an independent journalist or uh, something along those lines, something grassroots, so people that are bringing you the truth and bringing you the information, people that I use as sources for, for, for my comedy and for these pieces as well. So, uh, you know, by, by contributing and, and buying tickets or, or buying merchandise or buying those albums, uh, you, you're, you're contributing to also help um, a grassroots organization grow. Uh, so that is, uh, that's a cool little perk that I'm trying to do. I'm trying to do my part uh, during, during this crazy age that we're all living in. So uh, I hope you consider going through the links, uh, checking out what you want to uh, be a part of, checking out what you can donate to, um, and, uh, and help, uh, help, help this channel grow, uh, help me put food on the table, earn a living, all that sort of stuff. Um, and help the, some, a, a grassroots organization um, grow and, uh, you know, find their path in what they're doing uh, to, to make this place a better world for everybody. So um, stay tuned. There's a lot more content coming up on this channel. Thank you so much for watching this video. Thank you so much for uh, being a subscriber or, or considering becoming a subscriber for this, this channel. Uh, until the next video, uh, see you on the road.